I'm Tamika D. Mallory. And it's your boy, my son, the general. We are your host of TMI. Tamika and my son's information, truth, motivation, and inspiration. New name, new energy, but same old us. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, this is a new episode of TMI, and <laughs> it is the summer. It's August, and so... You know, uh, things have been a little bit different in terms of what we've been doing with the show during this month, but we will be back to our regularly scheduled programming come September uh, after our semi-vacation, but it's not really a vacation because we still have been bringing you all very, very important content. Uh, last week, uh, my son sat down with a group of brothers, many that I respect, all of them that I respect, and had a really, really powerful conversation. And I hope that you all have an opportunity to listen into that. We're back, my son, the general, you're back. We're here for we another here. Uh, another week. And today we're jumping straight into an interview with a very, very important uh, political and civil rights icon. Uh, I, we are at the convention. We're literally in Chicago at the DNC. And so there's so much happening. If you could see everything going on on the other side of this device, um, you would know how, how busy it is. But it was very important for us to bring context because one of the things that I think we both know, my son, is that the internet is telling us all types of things. Misinformation, people uninformed, people don't know history, people really don't understand the road that has been traveled to get not only to this moment, but the fights that have taken place and the struggle that has gone on um, in our world and certainly in America, in Black America for a long time. And so we asked this icon to join us this morning. Um, and if you don't know who he is, please do your research. We are talking with Dr. Benjamin Chavis, not just Ben Chavis. We so used to calling him Ben Chavis. He's Dr. <laughs> sure. Benjamin Chavis. And he, his current job is the uh, president and CEO of the National Newspaper Publishers Association. That's the National Newspaper Publishers Association, NNPA. But he has, you have, you are here with us, so many other things that make you a legend. That's your current uh, work that you are involved in, which is still a form of activism, telling our stories to us, um, by us in black newspapers all across the country. And I'm sure you, there, you know, it expands beyond that, but you are truly a legend in the civil rights movement. And we just wanna welcome you and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Tamika, my son. I'm so honored to be in your presence. You know, uh, Frederick Douglass said it best, freedom is a constant struggle. So each generation uh, I'm so proud of uh, has risen to the occasion. And it's not just a simple matter of passing a baton. I wish it was that simple. It, it was really uh, how to renew and regenerate our consciousness as a people. Who are we in the world? Who are we in America? Uh, not only what our past has been, but how does our past inform our present and our future? That's why I'm so honored to be here with you at the Democratic National Convention. This pivotal moment in, in world history, uh, you know, your sorority sister. I want you to know all of my family, my mother, my sisters, my grandmother were all AKAs. So I got a lot of pink and green in Oxford, North Carolina. That's oh, so your family, your family picked the right sorority to be a part of. I just want to make sure everybody knows it's a very serious matter. And Vice President Harris is also an AKA. So, yes. you know, we're on the right track. Absolutely, absolutely. But I'm a native of Oxford, North Carolina. I was born in 1948. So I grew up in the 1950s when everything was racially segregated. Uh, but, you know, even though things were segregated, I learned so much about uh, Black history, uh, Black knowledge, Black scholarship, Black excellence. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that much about white people because I was separated from them. You mm. know, I, I knew about the oppression. I knew about apartheid, but I never saw a white student until my sophomore year in college. Wow. And what college did you go to, Dr. Ben? Uh, the first college was St. Augustine's College at HBCU in Raleigh, North Carolina. 
And then I transferred to UNC. I was a chemistry major. Mm. And um, when I tried to get into uh, the North Carolina State, which is the white school, or UNC, the white school, they told me they were not accepting black students uh, uh, unless I majored in uh, music. There was the, I said, no, I want to major in science. And nothing wrong with music, but that wasn't my field. And uh, so uh, I was dissuaded, which is fine, because going to the HBCU the first couple of years was the best uh, decision of my life. And uh, it gave me a ground. So by the time I transferred to the University of North Carolina to finish my chemistry degree, I actually was ahead of the white students. They used to say, well, where did you come from? Who, who taught you this? organic chemistry and physical chemistry and, uh, you know, uh, nuclear chemistry. I said, some black teachers at a black school, that's what taught. Because, you know, I think sometimes we underestimate not only where we get our education, but how we get our education. And mm -hmm. um, so I grew up in the movement. I was uh, got my NAACP card when I was 12 years old. I started working for SDLC, Dr. Martin King Jr. when I was 14. Put my age up. We're not supposed to drive to 16, but I put my age up. I had mobility. I was driving. You know, I, I grew up fast. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, James Baldwin and I became very close friends, and he used to tell me the importance of writing. That the pen is powerful than the sword. So I started writing for the Black Press when I'm 11 years old in the sixth grade. And now, as God will have it, for the last 11 years, I've been the president and the CEO of of the Black Press of America, National Newspaper Publishers Association. But as Tamika said in the intro, uh, what I do now is informed by many decades of, of other struggle. Uh, to me, when you have challenges, uh, that's preparation. I, I once asked Reginald Lewis, who was the first Black billionaire, I said, Reginald, tell me one word out of the English language that led to your financial success. And he said, preparation, preparation. We have to prepare ourselves uh, to deal with uh, the struggles, we have to prepare ourselves uh, uh, to learn. And then I started working in the African liberation movements in Africa. I, I joined the ANC. I used to write for the ANC, the African National Conference Youth uh, Publication of the Spear while I was, uh, you know, in college and high school. And then uh, from 1963 to 1968, I was the youth coordinator for Southern Christian Leadership Conference until the day that Dr. King was killed in 1968 in April. So I've been around the block a few times, but you know what, uh, my son and Tamika, most brothers and sisters in the community, they, they, they don't know about the NAACP or the Million Man March. They know me from the movie Belly. I was the minister in Belly, you know. I just I, told you that. I was about I, to I was about to bring that up just now. Yeah, I, Belly. I go to the inner hood and they said, that's the minister from Belly. So, but that shows you the importance of not only our, our, our oral tradition, but our, our, our image, our visual tradition, particularly now among millennials and Generation Z, it's not only what we hear or even what we see. I use a hip hop. Hip hop is what you feel. It's just not what you see or what you hear, it's what you feel. And so I think our movement has been successful to the extent to which we can not only, yes, people can feel our oppression, oppression, but can people feel our liberation? Can mm -hmm. people feel what we need to do uh, to change our quality of life? And that's why I have mm -hmm. so much respect mm -hmm. uh, for you, what you and Tamika do, because you help people feel the reality of our struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. And I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a short answer to the next question. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I just want to say, first of all, it is an honor to be able to interview you, to be able to know you, to be in space with you, to get, you know, be able to be tutored by you. Just listening to you, you know, last night talk and all the times I've been in your presence and just hearing the wisdom that you have and knowing how legendary you are. And it's, it's, it's a shame that our youth are not only no belly, right? It's, it's yes. a shame that yes. our youth only no belly, but when you listen to the history, you know, that you, you've been through. I just want to know, like, what, what were the, some of the things that you you picked up working with Dr. King? Well, I picked up from working with Dr. King is that, you know, the eloquence behind the podium, the eloquence on the stage of life is informed by what happens off the stage. Mm. It's informed by what 
happens before you get to the podium, before you get the mic. You know, before you can drop the mic, you got to hold the mic. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So mm. a, as we uh, pick up the mic of life, I'm talking about as we broadcast, as Black like you're doing now, as we articulate, as we uh, disseminate information, uh, you know, we're informed by our lived experience. And so I've been blessed, uh, uh, Tamika and my son, to have had lived experiences with Dr. King, lived experiences uh, with Malcolm X, lived experiences with Minister Farrakhan, lived experiences with Dr. Dorothy Height, lived experiences with Rosa Parks, lived experiences with, you know, uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, Winnie Mandela. Uh, I, I was with Cuban troops on the ground. In, I was in the foxhole with Cuban troops fighting the South African apartheid regime in the mid-1980s. Because one mm. of the things I found out that, you know, it's one thing to talk liberation. It's one thing uh, to engage in armed struggle. It's another thing to engage in putting your life on the front line. Uh, you know, look, I spent most of the 1970s in prison because mm. I, to be very honest, I was mad. I was mad as hell when they killed Dr. King in 1968. But I learned to channel my anger into something a modus operandi that could help inspire to make sure his dream was not assassinated. How long were you incarcerated, Doctor Ben? About six and a half years. Mm -hmm. But I had a 34 year sentence. I spent most mm -hmm. of the 1970s in prison. Uh, the Wilmington 10 case, that's a whole, I could talk to you about the whole uh, program that they just on the Wilmington 10 alone. I'm so proud of the young people in Wilmington, North Carolina, who stood up to racial uh, white supremacy in the school system. And because they stood up, uh, eight high school student leaders, 16, 17, 18 year olds. Myself, I was uh, only 23 years old and a white anti-poverty worker, a woman uh, who was also in her 20s. We, 10 of us were sentenced to 218 years in prison. And uh, I had the long sentence, 34, 34 years. And so the analogy is, and I heard that Donald Trump had 34 uh, convictions, 34 felons. I said, well, damn, I wonder how much time he's going to get. You know, um, and of course, I, we got that time because wow. we fought white supremacy. But one of the things I learned from Dr. King. That is so Dr. big, but I, I really don't, I don't want you to brush past that because that's real. That is so, so significant. Not that you were, which, you know, we, we don't have any judgment on this show around what people may have done and how they, uh, you know, what, what road they traveled but you weren't scamming and killing or any of that. Your but, path to being incarcerated was because of your involvement in the civil rights movement. Yes, absolutely. And I think that, uh, uh, Tamika, uh, I'm, I'm always indebted to my mentors. I had great mentors, Floyd McKissick, who founded the Congress of Racial Equality. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. founded it. Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, I used to drive, I told Bakari Sellers yesterday, I used to drive his father, Cleve Sellers and Stoker Carmichael around uh, when they were in SNCC. Because back in the day, you just weren't in one black organization. You and every black, if it was black, I'm in. You know what I'm saying? That sounds like my parents and my life, how I grew up in Harlem. Exactly. We went to the Nation of Islam. We went yes. to National Action Network. We went to the Black Church. We went to the street corners. Exactly. We went to anything that had to do with Black empowerment. My, the slave theater. My right. parents were there. So it was one thing I guess I should point out anthropologically and genealogically. I was really blessed, uh, Tamika and my son, to be born in a family. The land we live on in, in Oxford, North Carolina has been in my family for over 200 years. My great, 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 great grandfather was the Reverend John Chavis. He was the first brother to be ordained as a Presbyterian minister. But what's significant is he was a freedom fighter. He was an educator. And this was before the Nat Turner insurrection. Uh, my grandfather was born in uh, 1767, fought in the Revolutionary War, came an ordained minister, then an educator. But in the early 1830s, uh, uh, the Nat Turner insurrection happened. The state of Virginia, the state of North Carolina, the state of South Carolina, the state of Georgia, the state of Alabama, the state of Mississippi passed a law making it a felony to teach blacks how to read and write. A felony. Wow. So my great-great-grandfather was an educator. So he set up an underground school 
in Granville County, my home county, Native County, his county. Uh, and so he taught white students by day and black students secretly by night. But they caught up with him. My my grandfather was uh, beaten to death. Uh, back in the day, there were no cars. They had a horse and buggy. And uh, they beat him to death, hit his body, cut the head off of his horse and took the, the head of his, of, of, of his horse to his wife. And uh, they, we never found his grave. They, they didn't even want us to honor him even in a funeral. So I grew up with that kind of history in my family. I come from a generation, yes, of educators, ministers. I'm an ordained minister myself. But, but the underlying common denominator, common denominator for the males and females in my family were freedom fighters. So I had no choice, man. You know, when I was in the fourth grade, fifth, uh, sixth, uh, uh, going back to the first grade, I knew what racism was. And, and, I, and I knew that's something that we should not have been tolerating. So I was one of the impatients. You know, I was impatient in my family. And that's why by the time I was 12, 13, 14, I thought I was grown. I'm ready to get it on. But get it on from the wisdom of the past. And like I said, I had great mentors. And that's what I try to be now to our uh, brothers and sisters today as a, as a mentor, not, not just as a leader, but as a mentor, because none of us will be here forever. Right. But while we are blessed to be here, let's pass something on. Let's, let's pass something on so the next generation won't have to go through the same things that we go through. You know, well, I Dr. Think, ben, yeah. before you go, before you go forward on that, because one of the reasons why we wanted to talk with you today, as we sat together last night in, yeah. um, in, in, the, in a very private meeting, uh, you know, I was thinking a lot about and my son have, and I have been talking about the history of this whole idea of the convention, right? We know there, this is not the first time in convention history that there has been major tension around different social issues. And the yeah. meeting that we were at last night, we were specifically dealing with uh, the issue of, of Black and Palestinian liberation and, and how our uh, struggles are intertwined. Um, and it made me think so much about 1968 and the climate for which that particular convention took place. And I know you have so much that you can share yeah with us about that. And so just, you know, want to give you, you know, an opportunity to talk about 1968, who were the, 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 the operators? Uh, yes. What was, the, give us the tea on what was Thank going you. down Thank in 68. I, I was a young youth delegate from North Carolina, my home state, 1968. And, and keep in mind, the 1968 convention happened uh, in the wake of Dr. King's assassination. It happened in the wake of Robert Kennedy's assessment. And then you had Richard Nixon running for president with Spiro Agnew, the former governor of Maryland, who were running on a law and order campaign. And so law and order wasn't just with Republicans, the Democrats were also. Mayor Daley was a Democratic mayor, but he sicked the police on the protesters, brutally uh, beating people down uh, as they tried to exercise their First Amendment rights. I was inside the convention center. And I was telling somebody last night to me, what a change time brings. From 68 to 2004, uh, we, we couldn't even, we had to fight even to get to be able to sit down in a convention in 1968. They didn't want black people to be delegates. They didn't want black people to be pages. They didn't want black people to have a media station. They didn't want, they, they were trying to exclude black folks in 1968. In fact, uh, uh, Julian Bond, Fannie Lou Heyman on, had to go to court <clears throat> just to get the right to sit down in the convention. So now we run in the convention. Black women are running the convention. You know what I'm yes, saying? So, yes, and, and a lot of times, Tamika, I'm glad you asked that question because we live in the present and sometimes the present uh, either overwhelms us or underwhelms us. Where we, we, we think that what's happening today is suspended in today's reality. But this is a long evolutionary struggle, you know, uh, even, even in the DNC. And let me just point something out. Uh, the Democrats were the original white supremacists. In my home state of North Carolina, the Democrats were the original white supremacists who attacked Wilmington, North Carolina, because uh, Blacks had formed a fusion with Republicans. 
look how the script is flipped. The Republican Party was once the party of Lincoln. Now it's the party of the white supremacists. Now it's the party of 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 of, um, of far right uh, uh, racism, anti-Semitism. You just name it. What, 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 when was the switch again, sir? Because there's always this, this conversation. Is the late late eighteen hundreds. Okay, late eighteen hundreds. There's always this thing that the Republicans is actually the party for black people, and this and that, and you don't know your no, history. No, no, no. History. You got to know that history. The, the script was split, flipped. You know. Uh, uh, Jesse Hams used to be a Democrat. He became a Republican with the Dixocrats. And uh, these are the people who fought when Thurgood Marshall got the Brown decision in 1954, uh, saying that uh, segregated schools was unconstitutional. So you had all these people who, who wanted to assassinate Thurgood Marshall, you know, uh, because of that litigation. Because they didn't want black and white kids to ever go to school together because we may find out something. And that is, there's no such thing as white superiority. There's no such thing in, in uh, while it is an ideology of white supremacy. It's a fake uh, ideology. It, it has no substance. It has no antipodal other than the brutal uh, um, transatlantic slavery that they uh, engaged us. And I want to plug a book that's coming out in September. To me, I got to get you and my son. Uh, Stacey Brown, one of our writers in the NNPA, we just published the book. It's coming out in September on the transatlantic slave trade. Because transatlantic slave trade didn't just start in 1619. It started in the 1500s. The transatlantic slave trade was going on 100 years before they brought the first slave to the Virginia shore. And uh, this brutality, this inhumanity, uh, you know, so to me, going back to Tamika's question, uh, I'm honored just to witness what's going on here in 2024. But it also means we have I'm a responsibility to What are those struggles? What are those alliances we should have? Well, what, what can we learn? What, what do we know about the Middle East? What do we know about 1948? What do we know about uh, the United Nations? What do we know about World War II? My father was a veteran of World War I. Do we know the sacrifice that black troops made uh, going to the front line in France, fighting for democracy, and then they get wounded and they can't even come back home on the ship, they came back home on the ship to German prisons. German prisons were treated better than black soldiers who fought the Germans. I mean, mm -hmm. all this stuff. And so I just asked my father, I said, Dad, how, how, what's going on? He said, son, one day you will understand and appreciate the sacrifices that we made. We know that racism, but we fought for America because hopefully one day America will change. And then, yes, America is changing, but still ain't changing fast enough. You know, and, and that's our role. Each generation has to push that envelope, push uh, those questions and push that reality. But at the same time, I am concerned about our state of consciousness as a people. You know, I was involved in the Black Power Movement. When, when I, look, when right. I was a kid, if you call somebody Black, that was a cuss word. People mm. would cuss you out. They think it was, we were so ashamed of our Blackness. We are sure claim of our color. We were so ashamed of our hair. We sure ashamed of our nose, our lips, because let me just share with you. When I was in the first grade, even though it was a black elementary school because of segregation, the white school system told us what books we had to read. So I learned how to read uh, out of a book called uh, Sambo. And Sambo was a caricature of a disfigured little African brother who only ate pancakes with uh, dripping syrup, did all drip down his throat. You know, it was like uh, they, they made him uh, like somebody. Well, I don't want to be like Sambo, but 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 planting it in the seeds of, of, of black students in the first grade. So, well, I don't want to be black. I want to be white. That's why when the brother did the study with black dogs and white dogs, a lot of black children uh, choose white dogs because that's how they've been miseducated. You know, mm. College of Wilson had it right: the miseducation of the Negro. You know, yeah. uh, and, and and so one of the fights we have in 2024 is about education. It's about yeah. uh, um, it's about curriculum. It's about consciousness. That's I'm glad you must... went there. I'm glad yeah. you yeah. mentioned it. A part of Project 2025, which yes. is uh, the conservative Republican platform that we know Donald Trump endorses, while he says he does not, we know why he's denying it. 
Um, but Project 2025, we know, has some very, very dangerous components. Yeah. One of the things in it, however, has attracted a number of people that I know, Dr. Ben, Black folks who have said, closing the Department of Education, they believe that that may be sensible, right? I don't think that Project 2025 is doing it for the reasons that Black folks want it, want something to happen. Yes. Project 2025, they want to change how children are educated to ensure that we are less conscious, as you said, that their own children learn less about our movements and our struggle. And they would like to deposit into us and our people and our children, whatever it is that they want that serves only the purpose of white supremacy. That's, that's what, we, what we know. However, there are people who have children right now in public schools across this country that have, and obviously Department of Education is supposed to be the governing body and people do not feel good about how their children are being educated. They feel their kids are being left behind. They don't feel that when they approach uh, the department or, you know, or, or administration, that there's anything really being done to deal with the disparities in education for our youth. And so what would you say to someone who's looking at that and saying, well, maybe for that particular reason, Project 2025 is good? Well, thank you. Uh, Project 2025 is the latest rendition from the Heritage Foundation of the institutionalized white supremacy institutionalization. And I think uh, when I listened to you, to me, you know what came to mind? The Willa Lynch letter. Project 25 is an expansion of the Willa Lynch uh, uh, letter that told the white supremacists how to keep black people divided, how to keep us at each other's throats, how to miseducate us, and so I, I think that, keep in mind, education is really not controlled by the federal government. Education is controlled by these local school boards, by these local states. While the Department of Education may pass a policy, but who implements the policy? You know, a lot of states have gotten funds, and because you have these reactionary governments, they don't even distribute the funds. And a lot of HBCUs should be getting funding, and, and, and that's why what Biden Harris administration has done so significant by putting billions of dollars back into HBCUs. But think about all the years where we didn't get that fund. You know, and so and then people try to equate, you know, how Harvard with I don't know, with Howard or uh, Morehouse with Stanford. But the resources were dramatically uh under service, under source. So I think this brothers and sisters who are concerned about education, yeah, that's right. But what is the solution to the education problem? I think education first has to start in the home. We give our children off to teachers we don't know. We give our children off to uh, curriculums we have not investigated. We go to PTA meetings. Who shows up at the PTA meetings? Who shows up at the school board meetings? Who shows up at the city council meetings? Who shows up at the county commission meetings? You know, who, who disrupts the state uh, legislature? I'm so glad that my, one of my mentors, uh, his name is Golden Frank, City of State Field Secretary, SCLC. We got so mad with the state legislature in uh, North Carolina. So while they were in session, we got a transfer truckload of chickens, and we backed it up and turned the chickens loose in the state legislature as a protest to what the state legislature has done. So I learned something about positive action around uh, education. The reason why the Wilmington Tim went to jail is because of education. And I'm so proud of the young people who wouldn't put their lives on the line uh, to fight for education. As some of you know, here in the uh, here in the city of Chicago at the United Center, there's a statue of the great one of the greatest basketball players. Um, you know, uh, and and I, I think that uh, we need to realize that what we've been through in the education process. Yes, we have demands. Yes, we have grievances. But the solution to our grievances is not Project 2025. You know, the solution to our grievances is not uh, accommodating from the Heritage Foundation, uh, which in my view is a uh, multi-million dollar enterprise that puts out uh, fake information and then 
passes that out. Uh, you know, I think that there is a debate about scholarship. There is a debate about uh, what truth is. There is a debate about where you find it. And then once you find the truth, how you disseminate that truth amidst this atmosphere of all the misinformation and disinformation. You know, uh, look what happened in 2016 when Trump and press got elected. He shouldn't have won that election. But there was so many Russian interference. They had, even today, fake accounts. I get so many, when I go on social media, I said, this ain't really no black person. It's somebody pretending to be black. I you know, be. you know, and then I saw, it was a sad commentary. Uh, recently, I saw a brother in uh, Georgia wearing a t-shirt, niggas for Trump. And he was proud of it. He was proud to call himself a nigga. He was proud of himself to call himself a Trump for sure. Yeah. This self-destruction. Malcolm talked about, uh, uh, you know, self-hatred. He talked about not loving oneself. But you, you get love of oneself first in your home. You get love of self in your church, in your community. Then you take that self-love to the schools and demand that uh, not only our students learn the truth about our history, but white students also need to learn the truth. Because they've, wanna, been wanna, they've been miseducated also. They are. I wanted to ask you about the um the gang conference you did because I do a lot of work with um um with at risk youth in the community, yes. a lot of gang members. So this yes. black murder campaign that we created, you know, it's around just trying to gear and just right. connect our youth and, and, and stop the self-hate and stop the violence in the but, community. So can you give me you. Yes. in 1993? I was so proud. I, I had just become the young director of the NAACP. And um, we held the first gang summit. Actually, the first gang summit was planned before I went to the NAACP. Mm. It was planned by the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice and other grassroots groups. You, as you know, in the early 90s, there was a war going on between East and West gangs. You know, uh, it really has not, not so much to do with territory. It has so much to do with how we define or misdefine who the enemy was. Mm -hmm. And we decided we need to put a stop to this. So we, we said, well, where are we gonna have uh, the first gang summit? We said, we're gonna do it in the middle of the United States. So the brothers from the East Coast have to go to the middle, the brothers from the West Coast come in. So we chose Kansas City, mm -hmm. Kansas City, Missouri. And hundreds of bloods, crips, gangs, gangster disciples, all kind of brothers and sisters, uh, well, it was mainly brothers. There were a few sisters, mainly brothers. Uh, all of the, what we call, shot callers in the streets uh, came. And uh, I remember the NWCP asked me, are you still going to have this gang? I said, absolutely, we're going to have it. And uh, we not only established a truce, which was important, but more importantly, we found out that we don't have to allow other people to define who we are. And we decided to train, change the name from gangs to street organizations. We decided to change the name. You know what? You can still be the blood and Chris, but whether you're doing to serve the community, you know, what is our service to our liberation? What is our service uh, to, uh, uh, to combat and uh, police brutality? You know, it's one thing for us to get upset when white folks brutalize us, but we don't get upset when we brutalize each other. There's something wrong with that script. And we wanted to change it. And I'm, I'm going to give you good news that once we got people around the table, my son, people found out they had common interests rather than contrary interests, rather than contradictory interests. We have common mm -hmm. interests, you know, because wow. when we're stopped by the police, the police ain't going to ask you whether you're a blood or a crypt or a gangster disciple. You know, they don't care. What, what, it is your blackness. It is your... It is what we've been through as a people that determines our fate. And so that was very successful. And after the Kansas City Summit, we held regional summits around uh, the country. Uh, and then of course, uh, you know, when the uh, Rodney King thing happened, you know, uh, a, a year or so later, uh, we went out to LA. <laughs> I stayed in the Nickerson Garden, Jordan Downs. I stayed in the projects. And a lot of the NWCP, oh, Doc, you should be staying at the Bonaventure Hotel downtown. And I said, no, I'm staying where the struggle is. If something going down in LA, I'm going down with it. You're going to know about if it. If something rise up, I'm rising up with it. And I was so wow. proud of the young people in South Central 
uh, because we'd had that truce, uh, look, I, I saw Bloods and Crips protecting mamas and daughters. I saw mm. them working together. Well, your color was red, whether well, your color was blue. I, I remember one of the founders of the Crips was going to give me his uh, a car. I said, no, man, I, I, I can't drive your car because people may think that I'm identifying with one group or another. I said, I'll walk. You know, give me, give me, give me some blood to walk through these communities. And one of the things, Tamika, you would be proud today. You know who the shot callers are today in the community? Mm. Sisters. Sisters yeah. running them projects. Yeah. Sisters is running yeah. South Central. You know, yeah. and because a lot of the brothers are in the joint, a lot of the wow. brothers are in the cemetery. So black women have risen to the occasion to take over the quality of life in those uh, what we call uh, projects. And of course, wow. in Chicago, they just they, they they dismantled and destroyed all the projects, made people flee the city. And that's why the city always looks, it, the, the demographics have changed. Same thing in D.C. Chocolate City used to be a, a black city. It's no longer because it's been pushed out because of gentrification. But, you wow. know, I, I just think that I want to make sure that whatever I say today on the program, that I give some hope, some inspiration. I don't want yes, us sir. to get yeah, this, this would be your your uh, final word. So please give us some inspiration. Well, thank you. First of all, looking at you and my son, I get re-inspired because I see the future in you too. I see the future in the colleagues that you organize and the colleagues that you mobilize. And uh, I remember when we started having the anniversaries of the Million Man March, you started showing up because you were an organizer, you know, putting stuff together. I was so proud of you. And I know a lot of people came down on you because of your association uh, with uh, that uh, grassroots mobilization. But you know what? It made you stronger. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this. I don't want people to think that I said, go look for some adversity to make you stronger. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the state of affairs of our people, we have to either let those affairs break us or make us stronger. You know, we, we, yes, we're resilient, but resilience comes from standing up. Resilience does not come from osmosis. So, you know, we, we, have, we have to lift ourselves up. Ain't nobody gonna come lift us up. We have to lift ourselves up. We have to hold our heads up with dignity, with purpose, with integrity. And, let, you know, I'm gonna close on this point. This is the year of the black woman. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I'm so proud of black women. You know, they not only took over this DNC convention, Guess who's taking over all the grassroots organizations in our community? Sisters, sister leaders, sister men. I mean, I'm so glad, you know, uh, you know, if we had to do another uh, belly movie, it'll be about these sister soldiers <laughs> taking over. I just want to ask yes, a question. And, and, and I, I feel the same way that you feel about our women taking over. But what do you say to the brothers who are feeling threatened by that? Right. Because I, 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 yeah. there's such a pushback. You know, that's, I celebrate our black women. I, I, yeah, I've that, been very, I've that's been a very good question. In about that's a very good question. I'm going to vote for Kamala Harris because it's a black woman. I want to see her win. And there's so exactly. many black men right now who are threatened by that. So what do you say? Well, I'm, I'm going to close out with this answer. As a black man, I should not and cannot be intimidated by the rise of black women. Mm. Because when black women arise, guess who I see rising? I see my mama rise. I see my grandmother rise. And you know, I see Queen Ashanti rising. Uh, I, I see the warriors, warriors, sisters. See, that's what I'm saying why it's so important that we learn our history. All the warriors were not brothers. Yes, the brothers are warriors, but sisters are warriors too. You know, yes, we had kings, but we also had queens. You know, and so I think that um, this dynamic, particularly now, my song, where some brothers are intimidated by the rise of black women, and they're using that as an excuse not to vote for Kamala Harris. I'm gonna tell brothers, study our history, study our consciousness. We should, in fact, we should all be inspired as black men by the rise of black women. Because when black women rise, the whole family rises. When black men rise, the whole family rises. We can't afford this conflict between black men and black women. What we need to do is embrace one another, embrace the success of one another. And if one of us fall, whether they're a sister or a brother, let's pick that brother or that sister up. Let's march together. Let's fight together. 
And if we march together and fight together, brother, my son, we will win together. And you said it all, Dr. Ben. We appreciate you. We love you. Thank you for Thank everything you. that you've done and you continue to do. And I'm just great, gracious to be able to have you as one of the individuals that I could reach out to, please. Thank you, God bless. Okay, thank you for this opportunity right. to meet you. Yes. Thank you, I love you. you so much, bye. Shout out to Dr. Ben Chavis. As you know, we are in the DNC and Tamika had to go to a panel. So shout out to her for this amazing discussion. When you listen to brothers like Dr. Ben Chavis, who has so much deep history, and you listen to what he's accomplished and, and the errors he went like, it's a, it's a shame that they want to do away with history like that. They don't want to notify you and educate you about brothers like Dr. Ben Chavis. When you when you listen to this is what you, this is a person that they would call a DEI hire, right? They would talk about identity politics, but when you listen to this man, he is probably one of the most intelligent people in the world. He told you how he went to an HBCU, and then when he transferred to North Carolina, he was ahead of the game. Right. So they they try to make you seem like the education in HBCUs isn't isn't um, equal, equal or superior to, you know, education in other schools. But that's obviously not the truth, because when you look at our brilliant black people who've, who've done so much throughout history, who who have acclimated. And and ascended in every area of life, you know, a lot of them come from HBCUs. So now they try to weaponize this DEI tag and, and this identity politics. I, I tell people all the time, I have no problem with identity politics. I'm with everybody Black. I want to see Black people get equity. I want to see them get justice. I want to see us get to the level that we deserve to be at because we've been denied those things. So me wanting to see positive things for my people does not mean that I want to see negative for anybody else. I just want to see my people reach the level that everybody else's people are. And there's nothing wrong with that. And people will try to make you think there's something wrong with that. As I'm at this DNC convention, surrounded by Black excellence, as I watched the DNC conference last night and seen Black excellence and seen leaders that I know came from grassroots organizations, people that I know was on the ground with me, be in positions of power to be able to change and make laws and policy. As I see a Black woman running for president and ahead in the polls, I am, I am motivated. I am motivated because I feel like things are happening. I feel like there's things happening. Anybody who's not motivated by that as a Black person, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what your motivation is, but I know I'm motivated. I know when my kids look into a room like that, they know what they can be. When you hear someone like Dr. Chavis and understand what he, the, the way he paved, he talked about how his grandfather lost his life. He lost his life to teach, right? So that he can be where he is today. Right. And every generation is responsible for its own liberation. So now it's time for us to be responsible for our liberation. So I'm going to do everything I possibly can to contribute to that. I'm going to stand 10 toes down. I'm not going to be distracted by haters, by bots, by whoever you try to send to deter me. I'm going to speak truth to power every time, because when you tell the truth, you don't got to think about it. You can sleep good at night every night when you tell the truth. Every night I'm going to sleep good at night because I know I tell the truth and I stand firm on truth. And everything that I say, I believe in my heart. There's nothing that can sway me from my beliefs. There's Unless you could tell me something that is that, that conflicts, that's right. Unless you can tell me a truth that conflicts my truth, that, that tells me that the truth that I have is wrong, I'm standing firm and I'm 10 toes down on that. And with that, it brings me to another end. It brings me to the end of another episode of TMI. Shout out to Tamika. Hope she's having a dope panel. Shout out to Dr. Ben Chavis. Shout out to all of the fans. We appreciate y'all. We're going to try to give you more content from the DNC. I'm going to go out and see who else I can meet, who else I can interview, so that y'all can get some of this knowledge. Because this black knowledge that they're trying to not put in these books is out here. And we got historians like Dr. Ben Chavis and the soul many others out here. So hopefully I run into some, we get some of these interviews and get you some of this information. But until then, I appreciate you. I'm not gonna always be right. 
Tamika D. Mallory's not going to always be wrong, but we will both always, and I mean always, be authentic. Until next time. That's how we Hello. own it. That's how we own it. Check out the video version of TMI. Every single Wednesday on iWoman.tv. That's how we own it!